How's everybody doing out there? It's the Mike Martin Show here on uh, blogtalkradio.com. As always, I'm Mike Martin along with uh, Chris Sterk. Sterk, are you there, man? Yes, I am. All right, excellent. So we're, uh, we're going to test some new stuff out here. I got myself a really fancy uh, audio mixer, so I've been, I've been playing around with that, uh, trying to get everything to go smoothly. And as you know, as always is the case with new technology, doesn't always go as, as planned the first time around. But uh, today's going to be a great show. As always, uh, libertarian politics um, and philosophy and just general hanging out, playing some good music. And uh, Stokes actually got a treat for us today. Uh, you're going to play your guitar in the background, right? Yeah, at, at some time, I'm sure I'll play a little bit. Excellent. I mean, this is what it's going to be all about, man, is just hanging out, having a good time, and talking some real philosophy. And today we've got quite a treat, um, because we have a special guest uh, on the line with us, who um, is all the way down in Auburn, Alabama right now. Uh, his name is Professor Walter Block from Loyola University, and uh, Professor Block is, I guess you could say, he's kind of like a Jedi of libertarian thought. Uh, Professor Block, are you with us? I am, and I'm delighted to be with you. Excellent. So um, we're going to be talking today a little bit about um, the questions that come up every time we debate the issues about um, stateless societies. Uh, me being a uh, anarcho-capitalist, um, I'm always faced with uh, the same sort of questions every time I, I talk to my friends about how a society would work without a government. So uh, Professor Block is going to help us out here in uh, talking about some major questions that always arise when it comes to a stateless society. So um, we're going to start right off the bat, but first I want to mention that uh, if you're interested in calling up and uh, talking to us here and, and hanging out and throwing out a question or two, you can give us a call at uh, 347-826-7648. That's 347-826-7648. So, uh, Professor Block, uh, before we start really talking about this stuff, uh, how are you doing and uh, how is Mises Institute over there in Auburn, Alabama? Uh, I'm hanging in there fine, and uh, the Mises Institute is doing very well. We're having Mises University this week, and we've got more students than we've ever had in our 22, I think it is, year uh, of experience. I think we're at around the 200 student mark, so it's um, it's very exciting. That is really exciting. And, and actually, as a matter of fact, I, um, I really want to attend one of these conferences, but it's kind of hard to get away from work for a couple of uh, days to go see it. Well, one of these days, hopefully, maybe, who knows? Yeah, and um, hopefully we might have something going on again here in New York, as I missed the Murray Rothbard thing uh, last year here in New York, so I'm kind of upset about that. But Yeah, the Mises Institute does have uh, meetings in New York either every year or every other year, and maybe we'll all link up at the next one. Sweet. All right, so... Um, I want to talk to you, to everybody pretty much about the uh, first question that comes to mind when you talk about a stateless society. Now, everybody thinks in a stateless society you're going to run into a bunch of, of lunatics on, on sort of a chaotic uh, spree to run amok and to cause damage and all kinds of things like that. And when I, when I usually start off, I talk about the um, non-aggression axiom, which is a big central part of libertarian ethics. Um, so if you, could you elaborate a little bit about what the um, non, non-aggression axiom is? Yes, uh, I think that you're quite right in pointing to the non-aggression axiom as the, I don't know, basic axiom or basic premise of libertarianism. And all it says is uh, we, all interaction should be voluntary. Nobody should coerce or force or aggress against anyone else. And we should buy and sell and give gifts to each other and trade and barter and whatever. And it all should be on a voluntary basis. So you now have a pair of shoes, I assume. I don't know. <laughs> We're on the telephone, so who knows. But you have a pair of shoes. And there are two ways I can get that pair of shoes out of you or off your feet. One, the voluntary way, and two, the coercive way. The voluntary way is I say, hey, I'll give you 100 bucks for them, or I'll be your best friend forever, or if you give me your shoes, I'll give you my tie and my wristwatch, something like that. And if you reject all these offers, I'll try and up my offer. And if you say, you know, sorry, these shoes have got sentimental value and I'm not giving them to you for anything, well, then uh, I just can't get the shoes and it's tough on me because they're your shoes. Now, there's another way I can get those shoes. I can come to you with a gun and say, hey, give me those shoes or I'll plug you. (laughs) Or I can steal them from you when you're not wearing them or something like that. 
And all the libertarian non-aggression axiom says is the first way of doing it is a voluntary way, trade, gifts, whatever is legitimate and ought to be allowed by law, whereas the second way of doing it, uh, murder, rape, theft, whatever, is illegitimate and ought to be prohibited by law. Now, there's nothing really wild-eyed about this. I think most people in our listening audience, if all they heard was that, yeah, they'd say, sure, you shouldn't steal the shoes. The difference between libertarianism and most people who would agree with that, however, is that libertarians are very, very rigidly, dare I say, consistent. Uh, we brook no exceptions to that general rule of non-aggression. Uh, for example, suppose I come into your house with uh, four friends, and uh, we're about to grab your shoes, and we're a philosophical gang, so you can discourse with us. And we say, we're going to grab your shoes. And, and you say, but I thought you were libertarians. Libertarians uh, believe in property rights, and they're my shoes. I say, oh, tut, 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 we'll have a, a vote. We'll have an election. And then I, I'm the gang leader, and I say, well, how many people want to steal uh, Mike's shoes? And me and my three uh, gang members, we all raise our hand. And then, to be fair, I say, well, how many are against? And you raise your hand. And I say, see, democracy. Uh, we get your shoes. Well, libertarians wouldn't go along with that because... This is a violation of the non-aggression act, Tim. Right. And uh, that's what the government is when it's a democracy. And that's the best sort of government, I suppose. The others are autocracy or monarchy or something like that, where the, uh, the dictator dictates. But even in a democracy, if uh, the majority, you know, you have such a thing called tyranny of the majority. So if the majority of people vote to take your shoes or to take your tax money, the hell with them, says libertarians, because they're violating the non-aggression act, Tim. Now, there is one more thing I have to say, because the way I see libertarianism is not really just a non-aggression axiom. There's the opposite side of that coin, and that is called property rights. Because if I take the shoes that you're now wearing, strictly speaking, we don't know if I'm aggressing against you, or maybe I'm recovering the shoes that you stole from me yesterday. In other words, we have to have a theory of private property rights as to who owns what before we can determine whether it's uh, aggression or not. So... Uh, how do we do that? Well, uh, the short and fast uh, way to that property rights is based on homesteading. Right. If so I am the first one to mix my labor with this land over here and I grow corn on it, uh, I own the land and I own the corn. If my, you're my next door neighbor and you domesticate a wild cow and now you've got milk, uh, you own that uh, milk. And uh, then any, uh, Robert Nozick tells us, any legitimate title transfer from that is compatible with uh, free enterprise and uh, laissez-faire capitalism and libertarianism. So, for example, if we trade, uh, I now get to own the milk even though I didn't produce it, and you get to own the corn even though you didn't produce it, but we can both trace our ownership of these new things to a legitimate title transfer, in this case barter, plus the initial homesteading. So there you have libertarianism in a two-minute version or a three-minute version. Uh, it's the non-aggression axiom and private property rights based on homesteading and no uh, exceptions, even for government. Right. And, and the problem with government... Now, I should be fair and say that most libertarians are not anarcho-libertarians. They're not uh, anarchists. I most think that's where Stirk falls in. Is not I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, that's where Stirk falls in, is uh, not being an anarcho-capitalist as myself. Right, but, uh, right. Right, and the uh, minarchist or minimal archist position, uh, that's not a pejorative, it's just uh, this is the way this is called. Uh, the most famous person of this sort is Ayn Rand, and she said, uh, I'm for limited government, I'm for laissez-faire capitalism. However, government has one legitimate function, and that is to protect persons and property, and property based on homesteading. She was a libertarian, even though she rejected that label. Uh, and to that end, there are three legitimate uh, institutions of government. Armies to keep foreign bad guys off of us. Police to keep local bad guys off of us. And courts to tell who the good guys and the bad guys are. And that's it for her. The problem that the anarchist libertarian or anarcho-libertarian has with that is that a government is necessarily a violation of the very uh, thing that Ayn Rand says it's supposed to protect against. Namely, it violates persons and property rights because of two things. One, it taxes people, and taxes are compulsory levies. If you don't believe that, try not paying and see what happens to you. And the other is that government is a monopoly. It, it demands a monopoly of this protection services, and why should it have a monopoly? Um, 
uh, we believe in competition in producing uh, shoes and and milk and corn, so why not in uh, protection services? So uh, as an anarcho-libertarian, I would say that um, government is per se uh, a violation of the very axiom of libertarianism that all libertarians agree, namely, uh, minarchists are a little inconsistent here. Right. And there's you, you touched on a couple of points, and, and one is, Whenever people ask the question, well, how would an, an, an anarchy work without a government, as long as it's a capitalist anarchy, there's always going to be order because of private property. So the people who own the property make the rules, and um, obviously being in a world of chaos is just not uh, conducive to anything that's creative or anything that's going to bring in any kind of wealth to you. So it's you, you kind of find it necessary to, to create a, a sense of order, even though there is no government. Well, I wouldn't say even though. I would say government is the, the greatest violator of order. I mean, uh, in the last century, governments, apart from wars, have killed, what is it, 170 million people of their own citizens? Right. Uh, uh, you know, so when you say that you're against chaos and disorder and blood in the streets, I tell you, I come from New Orleans, and uh, that sounds like what we've got right now. Right. Where government can't protect us out of a paper bag, so to speak, or to mix a metaphor there. Uh, we have uh, uh, in New Orleans we have murders every week uh, we have uh, the prohibition of drugs which uh, creates a lot of the havoc uh, and I'm not talking about the wars I'm not talking about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and maybe Iran I'm just talking about domestic killing and then also the fact that uh, some 40,000 people a year lose their lives on government socialist highways and somehow it's blamed on, I don't know, drunken driving or speeding or something, but it's really the government's fault. So okay. I'm not really a big fan of government when it comes to the, the tasks that the minarchists assign to it, namely protection of person and property. I think government uh, is chaos, and it makes us less safe, not more safe. Well, I totally agree on that. And if you've got any questions about this topic, uh, the number here is 347 826 Seven six four eight. Uh, Stirk, you got any uh, anything here? Any questions? Um, no, as of right now, I think I'm uh, I'm pretty content. Right. Hey, maybe we got a convert there. There you go. I mean, it's it's something that if you talk about it from the very roots and the very beginnings of, of non-aggression, and you explain to people that the government cannot exist without aggression, then I think you can sell over a lot of people, and that's been my experience in debating and talking about the issues is that if you break it down to to let people understand that the government or the state, any any state, is based on violence and it cannot exist without it, then I think you can start to understand how, you know, people like us who are, are more anarchists because we see the state as violence and it cannot be separated as such. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Now, there is one objection that sometimes people mention. They say, look, uh, the government is not coercive. It's really a club. And if you join the golf club, you have to pay your dues. Otherwise, they kick you the hell out of the golf club. If you join the tennis club, you, you have to pay your dues. Otherwise, they kick you out of the club. Well, the U.S. government or the United States of America uh, should more accurately be called the United States of America Club, uh, to just, you know, put it to, uh, in words that uh, uh, articulates what they really mean. So we have to ask, is the government a club? And the, the key uh, to being a club is that everyone has to volunteer for it. You, you don't, you can't be walking down the street and somebody grabs you with a an umbrella handle and around the neck and pulls you in and says, "Okay, you're a member of the club, whether you like it or not." That's not a club. So, is the United States a club like a golf club or a tennis club or a condo condo association where you have to agree to be a member of it, or is it um, or is it not? And you know, a lot of people say, "Well, look, you know, you're free. Uh, we have no rules against." emigration, namely you can leave, so if you don't like it here, leave. Well, you know, if you don't like it here in, in the golf club and you're not willing to pay your, your um, golf dues, well, then get out. It's, you know, you're really a thief by taking the services without paying the taxes. So we have to um, counter this. And how do we counter this? Well, we ask, well, how did the United States start? Uh, I don't know when it started, 1776, 1789. I'm not a historian, so I don't know exactly uh, dates. I'm weak on dates. But a long time ago, there was no United States uh, uh, club. There was Britain. And then we seceded from them. We had a little bit of a war about that, a uh, revolutionary war. 
and uh, all of a sudden we've got this uh, supposed club. Well, in the golf and tennis club, it has to be unanimous. Everyone who's a member has to agree to join, and for important things, you have to have some sort of signature. Well, who signed anything? Well, a bunch of people, John Hancock with a big signature, and maybe 15 other people signed the what was it, Declaration of Independence, which wasn't really the Constitution, which was supposed to be the, the club rules. Nobody signed the bloody thing. Now, take an example. Uh, some guys living in western Pennsylvania in around 17, uh, I don't know, 80 or 85 or so, and uh, he doesn't know anything about the U.S. He's out in the boonies, and, you know, the war passed him by. And out comes a revenuer from, I don't know where it was, maybe not Washington, D.C., maybe the cattle was Philadelphia, or anyway, some tax guy comes out to him in western Pennsylvania, which is really the boonies, mm -hmm. and says, um, hey, guess what? We started this United States club. And the western Pennsylvania guy says, oh, congratulations, that's wonderful. Uh, I'll be your good neighbor. We'll trade. You know, we'll be friendly. Uh, come on for dinner. And uh, and the revenue says, wait, you don't understand. You're part of this club. And the guy says, what? I'm part of this club? I don't want to be part of this club. Uh, clubs are supposed to be voluntary things, and you're telling me I have to be in it? And then the guy says, well, if you don't like it, leave. And he says, what, leave? Um, we've been homesteading this here patch of western Pennsylvania for, uh, you know, 100 years or whatever it is. We were here before your club started, and now you're telling me I've got to join your club? You know, uh, take a hike. So the United States club is not really a club. The United States government is a government, which is a compulsory thing, which is a violation of the, the non-aggression axiom, and the, the non-aggression axiom is the uh, basic premise of libertarianism. So government is per se incompatible with libertarianism, the views of the minarchists of the contrary notwithstanding. Huh. Well, I love the whole voluntary argument that people make is saying, well, our government's voluntary because we vote for the elected officials. But what they neglect to mention is that well, you know, Hitler was elected by a majority, right? A democracy over there. Um, and and you're, you're, when you're in an election, you're really, as an elected official, you're trying to get the vast majority of votes. So you're going to give, and you're going to give, and you're going to expect that um, people are going to vote for you. And in essence, all you're doing is really plundering the small minority of people in order to give to the majority of people. So naturally, the majority is always going to favor being... Um, or plundering the minority. So you're never going to get any advancement in society because it's always going to be based on plunder in some way. Some way or Well, I agree with you with two very, very minor reservations. One, strictly speaking, uh, Hitler didn't win a majority. He won a plurality. I think there were three major parties, and he won like 40%, and the other two guys won 30 each, or something like that, which was certainly compatible with democracy. Right. The second point is, it's not usually a majority that exploits the minority. It's usually a minority that ex uh, exploits the majority uh, in most uh, Western democracies. And uh, what they have to do is then hire the intellectual class, the, uh, the court historians or uh, professors or people like that, and they have to convince the people that uh, the government is either necessary or inevitable or a necessary evil or something like that. Uh, in other words, if, if the richest... Tr 95% try to exploit the poorest 5% of the population. They can do it, but the pickings are very slim. There's not much to steal. But if uh, the richest uh, or among the richest 5% uh, of the people want to exploit the other 95% of the people, then there's plenty of uh, money to steal, but they just have to hire intellectuals to make the case for them. So you have this unholy alliance of uh, ruling class types and um, intellectuals journalists and the media, you can see what happened to Ron Paul with the media as an example of that. No, exactly. Now, the question I want to ask you, and I've always been thinking about this, is as a professor, especially a professor of economics, and there's so much misinformation about economics out there, how do your colleagues receive you? Well, <laughs> that's a vicious, nasty question on your part. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to um, put on you there. Uh, I would say that the majority of uh, the professoriate thinks that I'm a loon, and that's the polite way to put it, uh, a nutcase or nut job or something like that. Happily, at Loyola University, New Orleans, uh, all four or all five of us, I forget that we had some change. I think there are now four professors of economics, and all of them would agree with me, maybe not on anarcho uh, libertarianism. I think three of us are anarcho-capitalist, and one of them is a minarchist, 
but all four are uh, free market uh, advocates. And I, for many years, I was sort of like, a, what is it, um, ugly duckling? And now I'm a beautiful swan because the swans at uh, Loyola University, New Orleans, uh, very much appreciate me, and we're all on the same page. So hint, hint, if anyone wants to uh, go to a good college where they'll get a great education and they'll have professors who are free enterprise, uh, think of us. You're listening to the Mike Martin Show here with uh, special guest uh, Professor Walter Block. Uh, if you want to get on board the program, it's uh, 347-826-7648. Um, and also you could uh, email any comments you have to mikemartinshow at gmail.com. And um, Professor Block, you wrote uh, a book that you asked me to talk about a little bit, uh, and I actually read it just recently, um, and it's called Defending the Undefendable. And um, if you could elaborate a little bit about what's in the book, and from, just to give you a little synopsis, um, it, it's a book about economic choices made every day by those people who you think as sort of the um, outcasts of society. And I think it's a really excellent way of looking at their conditions, like the prostitute, the uh, slumlord, um, things like that. So if you'd like to elaborate a little bit about that, now's your chance. Sure. Uh, the book, Defending the Undefendable, first came out in 1976. And amazingly enough, it's gone for about five printings and it's still selling. So uh, it's got legs, as they say. Well, what the book is about is really the non-aggression axiom and private property rights and uh, the libertarian theory, and then it applies it to a whole bunch of weird cases. Um, for example, it, it applies it to, I don't know, um, the drug runner, uh, the person who sells heroin. And what I'm saying there is not that I favor the use of heroin, I actually oppose it, but I think that there should be no law uh, for adults having heroin or cocaine or marijuana or any of those addictive drugs. Again, I oppose the use of them. I don't use it and I don't advocate anyone use it, but libertarianism is really a theory of the just use of violence and it says only in, in defense. And uh, to stop a, a consenting adults from selling and buying drugs to each other is, uh, is a violation of, of liberty. So uh, what this book says is that ordinarily in a free enterprise system, to change the analogy for a moment, there's nothing heroic about wearing a blue tie. I mean, you know, blue tie, no big deal. But if the government had a law prohibiting blue ties, then we would sort of say that it's heroic for people to violate that law because it's an unjust law. Uh, it, it, it's uh, So uh, drug dealing is heroic in my view or in the view in this book because it's a legitimate thing. The government should not be prohibiting it, and people insist on doing it and upholding their rights. So I regard that as heroic. I agree with you, especially when you have so many laws that just are ridiculous. In New York City, we're becoming more and more like fascistic with the kinds of laws that they're passing. Uh, for example, um, here in New York, if you get around, you need a metro card uh, to swipe to get a subway and the buses. Well, did you know that it's illegal? to sell a metro card swipe. So, for example, if a tourist came to you and they had no idea how to use the system, but they understood American money, and they said, well, I'll give you $2 if you swipe my metro card, and me being a good person, just a kind-hearted person, I agree. I give them two, they take, I'll take their $2 and I'll swipe their metro card. But I can go to jail for that. And that's ridiculous because there's nothing illegitimate in it. There's no violation of personal property in my selling a metro card swipe. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of – see, I agree with you because the government shouldn't be running the – what do you call it? The subways in the first right. place? Uh, originally, the BMT and the IRT, not the IND, were privately owned, and they were charging a nickel a fare, and they were going to raise it to a dime, and the government nationalized it or rather municipalized it. So the government shouldn't take it over at all. But, but suppose they were the legitimate owners of it, or suppose – I'm the legitimate owner of, uh, I don't know what, the, the Walter, uh, um, I don't know, uh, playground, uh, sort of think Disney World. Right. And I have a rule that to get in, you have to pay 10 bucks and, you know, you get a card swipe, but it's illegal to sell the card swipe to anyone else. In other words, a private owner could make that rule and it would be legitimate, but you're quite right in uh, criticizing the government for doing it because the government has no legitimate ownership right of that uh, enterprise in the first place. 
but it's not a per se violation of liberty. Because, look, suppose I invite you to come to my house and I say you have to wear a, a pink hat. Uh, you know, it's a little silly, but, you know, it's my house. Or if I say, you know, I'll give you the pink hat, but you can't sell it to anyone else or something like that. If you agree, then, you know, it's, it's an agreement. You see my point? No, oh, I, I definitely see your point. And, uh, right. you know, legitimate property, I, I have no problem with uh, with rules and regulations on how to use um, private property when it comes right, to right. my house or whatever. But the government, right. I, 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 I do, I get angry. And um, yes, it's a, no, I think you're you're quite right in getting angry. I just wanted to make the point that it's not per se uh, a problem with uh, telling people they can't resell things. Right. Uh, it's rather that the government shouldn't be able to do that. Heck, the government shouldn't be able to do anything because it's uh, per se an illegitimate uh, institution. Right. And it's gone even further in New York now because not only is it illegal to sell a MetroCard's way, but it's also illegal to sell any food with trans fat in it. Ah, that's that's totally ridiculous. Yes. And they're also pretty much uh, prohibiting uh, cigarettes. You have to hide them and you can't advertise them. I tell you, in Canada, where I spend my summers, uh, if you ride a bicycle, you have to wear a helmet. Whereas in New Orleans, you can ride a motorcycle without a helmet. I mean, you know, the nanny state is just going berserk. It is. We live in a world in which, you know, you're told what to do. You, I'm an architect by trade, and they basically tell you what kind of toilet you can, you know, uh, excrete in and what kind of light bulbs you can use in your house. Yeah. Uh, there's no end to it. And, and you know, as an anarchist, you, you understand that there never will be an end to it as long as the state is allowed to get away with these things. And that's just the, the state's nature is to keep growing and getting more and more powerful. So I think um, with that, we'll take a quick music break. And if you guys want to get on board the program, the number is uh, 347-826-7648. I have uh, a tune here from uh, Def Leppard for you guys. It's called Stay With Me, and it's on uh, blogtalkradio.com. And I'm Mike Martin alongside uh, Chris Sturch. Hello. And, uh, Hello. Oh, Sturch's still there. He's very quiet. Uh, just am. taking it all in. Uh, but uh, we also have special guest uh, Walter Block here with us. Um, and we're talking about uh, the main questions that come about when you talk about a capitalist anarchy. And we touched already on uh, some good points, uh, primarily the non-aggression axiom and how that relates to a lot of um, capitalist and uh, anarcho-capitalist thoughts. Um, but now I have some real questions that always come up when um, we talk about free market anarchy. And the first question that, that comes to most people's minds uh, is, how would you deal with uh, utilities such as, um, or not, not just utilities, but infrastructure such as roads, um, water, and electricity and all that stuff? What do you think, Walter? Well, let's take roads uh, first. Uh, I think roads are very important. Uh, the problem that I have with the present socialist road system where the government owns the roads is that Two main problems. One is uh, 40,000 people a year die on them. And the secondary problem is traffic congestion. Uh, New York City is known for its traffic congestion. Just the other day, I was in New York. I landed in the uh, Newark airport at around 10 o'clock, and I was trying to get in New York City. And I made the mistake of taking a cab, and we tried to get through the Lincoln Tunnel, and we couldn't. It was just a, a bumper to bumper, and this was like 11 at night. And we went to the Washington Bridge, and it took like an hour and a half to get across it. It's really horrible. But the main problem, I think, is not so much the traffic congestion, although that is a pain in the neck, uh, as any New Yorker, I'm sure, would agree with me. But the main problem is that around 40,000 people a year die on the roads, and you don't hear much about that. I mean, in Iraq, how many soldiers, uh, uh, U.S. soldiers have died? We don't count Iraqis because, you know, they're subhuman. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, just 4,000. In the war in Vietnam, 50,000 U.S. soldiers died, but that was over seven or eight years. So here you have 40,000 people, civilians, mothers, babies, children, grandmas, you know, uh, just get slaughtered like flies on, on the roads. And, and you don't even hear about this. Uh, Obama and McCain are now having a, a battle uh, to see who's going to be the president. And is anyone mentioning that? No. I mean, it's not even in the newspapers. Oh, every once in a while, if you have a... 15 car crack up and, uh, you know, 300 people die. Well, uh, you'll hear about it in the newspapers, but it's just sort of, um, 
nobody's got any solutions to it. Well, the free market uh, anarchists or the and, and the minarchists here also uh, uh, would uh, agree that we should privatize roads. Now, most people are going to say, well, you know, we're just talking about addictive substances. Uh, what are you crazy? Uh, what addictive substances are you now using, such that you think we can have privatized roads? If we had privatized roads, you know, you'd have carnage and death, and it would be impossible to have them. And you know, uh, every time you went down the street, you'd have to pay some little old lady a penny uh, as you went whizzing by our house at one mile an hour. Uh, so they think it's crazy. But as an actual case in point, the first roads. Uh, I hope everyone in the audience is sitting down for this, because if you're standing, you might keel over. The first roads were all private turnpike roads. Some guy would build a road and go from A to B and, uh, I don't know, uh, New York to Boston or whatever, and uh, he would uh, assemble a road that would not, not cement in those days. Uh, this was during uh, the 18th century, during the 1700s, when you had private turnpike roads. And uh, he would assemble land, and he would uh, grade it, and you'd get out some of the potholes and try to make it smooth, and there'd be a turnpike uh, payment system every couple of miles. And you'd have a road, and it was a private road. So don't tell me that uh, it's lunatic to uh, think of private roads and highways. I think some the, people think, I'm sorry? I think the greatest example of private roads anywhere is Walt Disney World in Florida. Oh, uh, yes. You see the uh, Walt Disney World has uh, many roads uh, within it. Uh, many college campuses have got uh, highways or little streets in them. Uh, condominium associations, golf clubs, whatever, they all have little bits of private roads. But I'm talking about, you know, uh, I-90 or the US-5 or whatever. Uh, I'm talking about uh, limited access highways. I'm talking about arterial streets, avenues, roads, Main Street, Broadway, Fifth Avenue, whatever you have in Manhattan there, 59th Street. It should all be private. There shouldn't be any government involvement in the roads whatsoever. Now, the obvious objection to my claim that socialist roads are killing people is to say, well, no, it's not socialist roads. It's rather, now they come up with a long, long laundry list. It's uh, speeding and drunken driving and vehicle malfunction and driver error and how far the hospital is away from the place and how good the ambulances are and, and all sorts of weird things. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has about 125 different causes of uh, highway fatalities and none of it has got anything to do with the government. Now, to me, this is a confusion of uh, proximate with ultimate causes. Look, suppose I take a gun and, and just shoot uh, some innocent person, and now a whole bunch of people grab me, and they're about to charge me with murder, and I say, hey, it wasn't me, it was the bullet that killed him. Everyone would laugh at me, and they say that I'm confusing proximate and ultimate cause. But of course, the proximate cause is the bullet. But the ultimate cause is my finger on me or, you know, my purposes. And I'm guilty, even though I was uh, 200 yards away from my victim when I shot him with a rifle. Take another example. Uh, take the uh, restaurant that goes broke. And uh, suppose we were called in as uh, restaurant consultants and trying to figure out why the place went broke. And we started this stupid list of, well, you know, location, location, location. They didn't locate the restaurant in a good place and uh, they didn't hire a good chef, and uh, the food was lousy, and the waitresses were surly and slow, so when the food came, it was uh, cold, and they didn't uh, clean the place, and uh, the, the, there was obstreperous uh, people there, and they didn't uh, keep the peace. Would we accept for a moment that these are the causes, the ultimate causes? No, these are just proximate causes of the restaurant going broke. The ultimate cause is the bloody manager. The manager didn't locate the restaurant properly. He didn't hire a chef. He didn't get hire someone with a broom. He didn't hire a waitress who was uh, reasonable. So uh, the manager is the problem with the, the restaurant, and if the manager is the problem with the restaurant, he's the, he's the ultimate cause. Well, then in Rhodes, who's the manager? Who's the person who isn't dealing with drunken driving? Who is the person who's not dealing with um, uh, speeding? Who's the person who's not dealing with all these other 125 so-called causes of death. It's the bloody government. They're not dealing with it. Look, in the, in the case of restaurants, the reason restaurants are pretty good is because whenever you have a lousy restaurant, what happens to it? Well, it loses money. And if it keeps being lousy and it keeps losing money, what happens to it then? Well, they go bankrupt and uh, the remaining restaurants are a little bit better. The problem, and, and that's true of any capitalist enterprise, and that's a very salutary effect of bankruptcy. It uh, weeds out inefficient uh, producers. But you don't have that in highways. 
if um, if the Lincoln Tunnel is lousy but the Hudson Tunnel is good, does the Lincoln Tunnel lose money? No. Uh, the government doesn't lose money. Uh, uh, I was in New Orleans, and we had uh, Katrina and the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, FEMA. Uh, by the way, a great bumper sticker, FEMA happens, a very popular bumper sticker there. See, I don't mind the fact so much that they killed around 1,100 people. I don't like it, but what really ticks me off is that these – Wretched people are still in business. Right. And that's no way to run a railroad. The, the way to have a, a, a civilized economy is when you screw up, you you get out of business, and you leave the industry for other people who can do a better job. Well, that's why we have so many deaths on the highway, because you don't have any competition. Right. Now, uh, Walter, if I can interrupt you for a second. We have a caller on the line. Uh, caller, are you there? I am here. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's okay. This is James. Um, Mike, I'm, I'm your friend, James. <laughs> I know. James is actually one of my good friends from back in the college days, and he was also a DJ on WQRI with uh, Stirk and I. So, uh, uh, James, tell us a little bit about uh, what question you have for uh, Walter. Well, uh, well I uh, want to say, first of all, um, I'm getting a little feedback here, so sorry if I stutter. Um, I want to say, first of all, that Walter, thank you very much. You're one of my personal heroes, and I love listening to all your lectures on Mises.org. And, I don't know, you've been a great inspiration because, to me, you follow the principle, and you let everything else fall to the side, and it's it's just an inspiration, it, just in, in the same line as Murray Rothbard, really. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. I'm delighted to be mentioned in the same sentence with Murray Rothbard, who was my uh, mentor. And, you know, James has actually been my mentor in libertarian thought. So my political Yoda, I call him. <laughs> well, well, obviously, I'm nowhere near as good as Murray Rothbard, so um, <laughs> let's not mention me. Um, what I wanted to ask is I actually work in a copy center, and it's in a retail store. And I know by, from studying economics, I sort of do it on the side. So I, I haven't really gone to school for economics. It's just some, like a hobby of mine. And Austrian economics, obviously, because you know I'm a big fan of yours. Um, what I wanted to ask is, our wages say, for instance, it's it's supposed to be that you earn the marginal uh, revenue product, and that determines your wage or the discounted marginal revenue product. And but we don't make anywhere near that, so we can bring the copy center sort of $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour, and we're getting paid what 12 or something. So I'm, I just wanted to understand the disparity there. Well, you have to realize um, if if your gross receipts are say a thousand an hour, mm -hmm. and let's say there are three of you, so uh, you, you might think that your contribution is three hundred and thirty-three each per hour, mm -hmm. right? That sort of a thing, and you're well, making it, oh I don't know uh, ten dollars an hour a salary. Yeah, and you're wondering like about the disparity between three hundred and thirty-three dollars and ten dollars an hour. Is, is, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, absolutely. So if it's it tends towards equilibrium or it tends towards, you know, what we're producing. It, it doesn't seem like it's tending that quickly. Do you know what I mean? Well, uh, with regard to the disparity between this $333 and the $10 that you're paid, there's mm -hmm. a lot that you have to take into account, like that the owner has to uh, pay for the machinery. He has sure. to uh, pay to set the thing up. He has to pay uh, uh, either rent if he rents the place or he has to um, – pay the alternative cost of what he could have rented it if he owned it, and uh, he must have put in, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand or a million dollars in terms of um, machinery, which could have been earning interest. Mm -hmm. So when you take all those sort of things into account, he's got a lot of other payments to make beside you and your two buddies who are working uh, in the Kinko's kind of place uh, for that sure. year an hour. So you're talking about overhead uh, and, and that... And, and let, let's suppose that what you were right, and let, let's ignore everything I just said, although I think what I said was pretty definitive, but mm -hmm. let's suppose that he was, uh, that you guys were really uh, producing at the rate of $333, and he was only sure. paying you $10, and he was therefore making $323 profit off of you? Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't some other capitalist pig uh, hire you away from him and well, offer you $11? An hour, sure, oh, well, and, and therefore make 
make only a profit of uh, 330 minus 11 versus minus 10. And wouldn't sure. somebody else pay you $12 an hour? Wouldn't mm-hmm. somebody else pay you 13 if you were that bloody productive, which I'm claiming that you're not really? But if you were, <laughs> you would be like a walking, uh, I don't know, burrito or something. Everybody would want to take a bite out of you. And the way they would want to take a bite out of you that is exploit you is by offering you a higher wage. Sure. Now, there um, are some people who are worth uh, $333 an hour, but they're, they're not people who work in, um, you know, um, uh, Kinko's or anything like that, uh, maybe lawyers or high-priced accountants or doctors or people like that. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that your marginal revenue productivity is anything like uh, three divided by the, the thousand an hour. Okay, so but they pr- they let us know their numbers. So, for instance, we know what the, the margin the profit margin is on any given service, right? And so the copy center generally is around 60 or 70% margin, give or take what you're selling. And so, yeah, you could discount all the overhead and that goes, you know, and that's reflected in the margin. And so even if, you know, we're being paid 10 or whatever it is, and then we're bringing in, and, and it could just be me, I could make the $1,000 sale and it, you know, it, the sale might come in two days and someone else might ring it out or whatever. But say it cost them, you know, even $400 to make the sale. I mean, that's still a margin of $600 or whatever it is. And I, I, I made the sale, and, you know, I, they only paid me however long it took me to consult with the customer to, to bring in that sale. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you get this joke where some uh, technical person, an engineer is called in to solve some problem and, it takes him one minute, and he charges, uh, I don't know, 2000 bucks. Mm-hmm. And the guy says, what, 2000 for one minute? And the guy says, well, you know, uh, 2000 for one minute to give you the opinion, but to learn all the stuff that I needed to give you the correct opinion, that took years. Sure. So okay. you have to put these things in. i got to say, James, you went from being my uh, political Yoda to being a walking burrito. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty well, sweet. Well, I could do that to you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> pretty well, great I'm, just, uh, you, I'm, I'm trying to make, uh, you know, make the thing come alive because economics is supposedly boring, and and I'm trying to just make it come alive here. So I hope I didn't insult you by calling you a walking burrito, but I, I thought the uh, metaphor was apt. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be okay. I'm, I'll, I'll be fine with it. I'm the recover. Right. I'll certainly never look at you the same way, you know. My mouth. Is <laughs> you. Well, if you try to take a bite out of me, that's I think that's a private property infringement. I might have to react. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, these are great questions because you also have to uh, realize that, um, you know, people always, uh, especially um, Obama supporters, these these guys are the worst because they they spout up so much economic fallacy. You know, they're always uh, claiming that the big companies have to screw everybody. But people don't realize there's a lot of overhead that goes into things, especially um, ATM charges. This seems to be something that liberals have a, a, a tremendous hate for. They don't think it's anything wrong, there's anything wrong with paying a $2 charge on an ATM, but, you know, they're all for paying you know, 40 50% of their income in taxes. But the point is an ATM needs to be maintained. You need this overhead of the, um, the place that it's in. Um, some ATMs, the, the owners have to pay rent to the store that the ATM is located in. So there's a whole lot of things that go along with the $2 service charge on your ATM. Same goes with uh, the wage, things like that. Oh, le- I agree entirely. And you see, the, the beauty of the market or the magic of the market is that if there are profits in Industry A that are gigantic, uh, other investors will go into Industry A, thus lowering the, the profits. Profits are a signal that uh, we need help there. Uh, for example, uh, I hate to keep bringing up New Orleans things, but it's very apt. In New Orleans, right after Katrina, uh, the, uh, there was shortages of things like, I don't know, uh, flashlight batteries and candles and milk and water and orange juice and stuff like that. And the prices went up very high, and uh, they were accused of gouging. Well, uh, the salutary effect of a, a high price rise in the face of a shortage, as you had in New Orleans, is twofold. One, uh, on the demand side, uh, it rations the goods. In other words, at the old prices, the first uh, 15 people into the Walmart are going to buy up everything. 
and they'll leave nothing for the people next online. It won't be uh, very salutary. So if the prices are tenfold, people are going to start thinking, do I really need 25 quarts of milk? Maybe uh, the milk will go bad before I drink it and I'll only take two or three. Uh, so that's one salutary effect of a price rise or a gouge, uh, so-called. Another one is that... Uh, you know, uh, Adam Smith said it's not from benevolence that the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker give, her, give us their wares. It's rather out of a keen appreciation of self-interest. So without prices rising and sharply, the only motivation of other people to help the people in New Orleans would be benevolence. And, you know, benevolence is all well and good. But when you have an emergency, you want to mobilize all sorts of motivations, not just benevolence. And you want to motiv uh, mobilize uh, greed or you know, profit-seeking. So if everyone knows that prices are skyrocketing in New Orleans, then, you know, they'll bring stuff from Texas and from uh, Kentucky and from Tennessee, and that'll help uh, reduce the prices back down to where they would be. And if you don't allow the prices to rise, you just get a shortage. And uh, and yet when Governor Blanco heard about price gouging, she threatened to put people in jail, and everyone was applauding her, and this is just economic illiteracy. Exactly, and you made a great point there about resources coming in. It's simple economics. You know, if all of a sudden in Louisiana, things, uh, because of the natural disaster, my products are going to get more money, I'm going to send a couple of truckloads over there and try and sell it off. So in the end, everybody is benefiting because there's more influx of resources, more medicine, more water coming in. So which, if, they, if you stop that from happening, there's not going to be that influx. And, um, Precisely. You know, that's, the, that's the beauty of the price system. If it's allowed to be... Uh, laissez-faire, namely uh, free prices. But when government steps in, it just bollocks up the works. And now, I mean, that leads to another question now that's a hot topic is oil prices and gas prices skyrocketing here. And, um, you know, far beyond, uh, I mean, Obama and McCain are both going to keep blaming uh, their to speculators for this problem. But the real problem, and the way I see it, is that there's a, an increased demand on oil and gas, and there's a limited supply, just like anything else that has a limited supply and an increased demand, the price is going to rise. Right. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, there are really two sources of this. One is inflation. Uh, you know, the prices of everything are rising, not just oil. But oil is rising faster than other things, and that's because of demand. And uh, uh, it's because government hasn't allowed uh, any nuclear, uh, any new nuclear power plants in, I don't know what, 30 or 40 years. They don't allow drilling in Alaska. They don't allow drilling offshore. They make all sorts of regulations uh, on drilling. And uh, so the government is the cause of the problem, and they're blaming speculators, and they're blaming uh, oil uh, profiteers and this and that and the other. Uh, but the whole thing is, uh, again, economically illiterate. Exactly. 347-826-7648 if you'd like to get on board and uh, certainly uh, discuss some of these hot issues that are going on. Um, with oil and gas, too, there's also a lot of other government meddling beyond just inflation. Like you said, the nuclear uh, problems. But there's all kinds of environmental regulations that are really, you know, hampering the ability of, of people to find fuel. So the next question that comes to mind when people talk about a capitalist anarchy is, well, how do you take care of the environment, then, if there's no regulation forcing you to take care of the environment? Well, I think there would be uh, regulation, there would be laws under anarchy. You know, people think uh, anarchy is a synonym for lawlessness, but uh, I don't see that at all. Uh, maybe some kinds of anarchy are that way, left-wing anarchism or whatever, but libertarian anarchism is uh, very predicated on the law of property rights, uh, as we talked about with um, uh, non-aggression. And uh, let's take the case of pollution. Uh, let me tell you a little fairy tale, uh, a story, and as all fairy tales uh, have to, they start with once upon a time, a long, long time ago in a foreign land, only it wasn't a foreign land, it was the U.S. Uh, in the 1830s, and this isn't really a fairy tale, this is based on Murray Rothbard's uh, brilliant essay uh, on air pollution, uh, where he bases uh, some of his work on this guy, um, Morton, I think his name, a Harvard uh, historian. Uh, in any case, if anyone out there in Radio Land is interested, I give you the sites to, uh, to this. No, they're not Morton. The guy named Horwitz, H-O-R-W-I-T-Z, where Murray Rothbard got some of this. Okay, so here's the story. In the 1830s, 
there was a spate of what we would now call environmental law cases, lawsuits, only in those days they called them nuisance cases, but it's the same thing. And uh, typically you get some little old lady who was uh, saying that uh, I hung out my washing and it was uh, wet and clean and I came back an hour later and it was dirty and dry. And that there factory three miles away, you can see a smokestack and, and it got its uh, dust particles onto my laundry. Or there'd be some farmer and the farmer would say, you know, that there railroad, I had these... Uh, haystacks uh, sitting uh, 100 feet away from the, the railroad, and uh, the, the sparks uh, flew off so hard and fast and high that um, uh, the uh, railroad uh, got my haystack uh, on fire. And these would be environmental plaintiffs. And in the 1830s, not every plaintiff won, but, uh, you know, the courts were uh, libertarian courts in those days, and uh, they pretty much said, look, uh, these are violations. You just got to keep your sparks to yourself. You got to keep your dust particles to yourself. And they would award uh, the plaintiffs, the little old lady and the farmer in our fairy tale here, or actual case uh, as it happened, and they would uh, award them two things. One would be um, damages, namely they'd make them pay for it. And the other is they would award them an injunction. And an injunction was an order from the court saying if you uh, keep up doing this, we're going to stick you in jail. So uh, then what happened was that the railroad and the um, uh, uh, factory owner had to take into account these costs. Uh, sometimes it's called externalities in, in economics. They had to uh, maybe um, use some research and development into uh, preventing sparks from flying so far away or they had to stick something in their smokestacks, uh, mesh or whatever, that would catch most of the uh, pollution. Now, look, you're not going to stop all uh, pollution. Uh, there is such a thing in law called de minimis. The law doesn't take into account trifles. We all do exhale uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but, you know, we homesteaded that right. So uh, there were all sorts of uh, very good things going on in the 1830s. There was even a, an environmental forensics. Now, we all know about forensics from watching, what, what's that TV show, ICS or something? CSI? Uh, CSI? CSI, that's it. Uh, where they're always into uh, hair follicles and blood and semen and, you know, uh, fingerprints and this and that and the other. Why? Because we have laws against murder and uh, rape. Uh, well... When in the 1830s, when we had uh, laws against uh, dumping your crap onto the lungs and land of other people, we had a, you know, it wasn't very scientific, it was only 1830s, but there was a little environmental forensics, namely, here's a dust particle, where did it come from? Let's go get the guy who is responsible for that and uh, get an injunction against them or get damages out of them. And uh, there was a, a move toward, uh, what is it, um, uh Sulfur coal, which is the bad coal, is very cheap, but it burns dirty. And then there's anthracite coal, which is more expensive, but it uh, burns much more clean. And there was a move toward anthracite coal and away from sulfur coal. So all in all, uh, things weren't perfect, but uh, things were pretty good. Okay, now we move to the progressive period, the so-called progressive period, which is, oh, 1870, 1880, uh, 1890, 1900, 1910. And now you get the same little old lady and the same um, uh, farmer coming into court, and now there's a sea change in the law, the way the law is applied. And what happens is uh, the court all too often is saying, yeah, yeah, we know, the, the railroad and the, um, uh, the manufacturer, yeah, they're polluting you. You're stinking lousy, selfish private property rights. There's something more important than you're stinking selfish, lousy property rights, and that's the public good. And what does the public good consist of? It consists of manufacturing. Why? Why was this sea change in law? Well, in the 1890s, which country was number one in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest, toughest, meanest, baddest uh, country on the planet? It was England, UK. And U.S., uh, the powers that be in the U.S. wanted us to uh, be imperialistic, and they wanted battleships, and they wanted, uh, you know, uh, tanks or whatever it was uh, in those days. And the way to get that is to not uh, put handcuffs on uh, somebody who's making steel or, or a railroad or, or industry. So they told the little old lady and the, um, uh, the farmer to get lost. 
Now, they did throw one SOP to them, and the SOP was they had minimum smokestack height regulations. Namely, previously, the smokestack height was 20, 30 feet. Now it was 200 feet. I'm just making up these numbers as an example. I don't have the exact uh, heights of smokestacks uh, at my fingertips. And in a sense, what they did is they didn't put the problem under the rug. They stuck it into the clouds. Now the little Ollie had not a uh, hope in hell of figuring out where the pollution came. It might not have come from the, the factory two miles down the road. It might have come from 200 miles away, uh, given the... Uh, uh, the winds, and, that, and now in the uh, 1910s and 1920s and with greater industrialization in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, you get the China kind of a syndrome. You know, now in China they're going to have the Olympics and they're afraid the, the marathon runners are afraid to run because they'll, you know, <laughs> be like smoking five packs of cigarettes to run through that gunk. Well, the, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the reason that we have the crisis is because government, which is abrogated the, the responsibility for, for protecting the environment it has, has just done the opposite of that by, uh, uh, by violating the law of private property and non-aggression. Yeah, the idea that something is for the greater good, you know, they allow people to get away with too much. But uh, right. anyway, we're going to go to a quick music break here. Uh, if you want to get on board the uh, Mike Martin Show, the number is 347 826 7648, and you could always email your comments to Mike Martin Show at gmail.com here on blogtalkradio.com. It's the Mike Martin Show, hanging with you guys here. And of course, I'm Mike Martin, hanging out with uh, Chris Sturk and uh, Walter Block. Now, you know, um, I got some criticism here on the Instant Messenger for playing the pipettes, but I got to say, guys, it's a pretty catchy song, it's, and it's not too bad. And um, the reason I picked up the album cover is because there are actually three really attractive French babes. So I got to say that that makes it all the better. I can't say I'm surprised by that one. Yeah, you know, start. You, you know, when we were back in the QRI days, you'd look at an album. Most of these people we've never heard of these random band things. You absolutely have no idea who they are. So right. the only really way you have to judge it is by looking at their album art. And so if they have attractive album art, chances are you'll pick it up and take a listen. So that's how I end up with these random songs like that. But anyway, we're um, asking some questions about anarcho-capitalism. Uh, Sturkey, you got anything? What was that? I cut out. I said, you got anything to uh, talk about? Um, no, I don't, actually. <laughs> You're surprisingly quiet uh, today. I know, I'm just trying to, you know, sit sit back and kind of wrap my head around everything. It's a lot to talk about, certainly. Um, you know, uh, you're asking people a lot of uh, mental power to just think about a world without government. So right. it's it's a little right. hard to do that. And um, we actually have a caller on the line here. So, uh, hello, you're on uh, blogtalkradio.com with Mike Martin. What's happening? Hi, Mike? Yes, how are you? Hi. Fine, thanks. Listen, I caught the end of your show, and I think you guys are real interesting, but is there any chance you guys can give me a little bit of feedback, uh, go back a little and tell me what exactly is a libertarian? Sure. Uh, Walter, you want to handle that? Well, uh, sure. Uh, a libertarian is someone who believes in a non-aggression axiom and private property rights based on homesteading. And, okay, okay, uh, slow down people... a little. I'm sorry? You're going too fast for me. Slow down a little. Oh, sorry. Um uh, non-aggression axiom, which means that the only legitimate way to deal with each other is on a voluntary basis. So we can seduce each other, but we can't rape each other. We can uh, uh, make each other offers, but we can't make demands uh, or compel people to do things. And I think most people would agree with that. After all, the if I want to get your dog, uh, you know, let's say you have a dog and I like your dog, uh, there are only two ways I can get your dog. One is by threatening you that I'll beat you up if you don't give it to me, which is illegitimate. And the other way is I try to buy it or befriend you and say, if you give me your dog, I'll be your best friend. Or if you refuse because you, uh, you love your dog, well, then I just can't get it. And most people would agree with Can you apply that, though, to, go, to like libertarian as opposed to uh, uh, democratic or republican views or independent views? I mean... Can you make a comparison across the board like that, or it has really nothing to do with that at all? 
Oh, no. On the contrary, it has everything to do with that. <clears throat> because the Democratic and the Republican parties both uh, think that you can grab people's dogs or their other property through taxes and uh, compulsions of various sorts, regulations, where it's only the, the libertarians who would be pretty much against that. So you mean libertarians would, like, really go for no taxing, in other words? Well, the moderate libertarians would reduce taxes to that amount that is necessary to support the government to protect people, and for that you'd have armies, courts, and police, and that would be it. Uh, that would be the minimal government libertarians or the laissez-faire people. The so it would be more like a volunteer kind of government? No, no. Uh, the min the Most libertarians would say that government has one legitimate function, that is to protect people, and to that end they have but a libertarian legitimate... Would still, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just, I'm just trying to get the concept... But a libertarian would still be a politician, right? Yes. Uh, He's just Ron a different Paul, type uh, of politician. He'd still get paid well, like the Democrats do in Congress and the Republicans. and you still get It's still a paid job, right? Yes. Ron Paul, for example, is a uh, libertarian congressman who is running for president. Yeah, but he never he accepted launched. any money while he was in Congress, Ron Paul. Oh, no. He accepted uh, his salary. He gets paid his salary like every other congressman. Oh, really? I thought... I thought, looking at his website, he didn't get a, a salary. He gave it up because since he was a physician, he was making his money as a doctor anyway, and he never really accepted the full salary that they gave him. That's what I thought. No, I think uh, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that I'm right, that although Ron Paul is an uh, obstetrician gynecologist, uh, and he had practiced it for many years, uh, he regarded his uh, congressional uh, seat as a full-time job, and uh, while he did practice when he lost the election for a couple of years, uh, when he came back, uh, when he was in Congress, he, he was not working as a doctor, so he uh, he accepted That's his salary. salary. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So he, I mean, he's not an anarchist libertarian. Well, so you still get you still get a salary, cooler, right? Uh, and you still people still have to yeah. vote for you like any other politician, right? Correct. Except you believe in really like no, like reduced government or something like that. Very, very heavily reduced government, yes. And then the services would all be privately owned, or like the services yes, to support uh, the streets, the police, and all the other agencies, they would be privately owned? Well, not police, and not armies, and not courts, but pretty much everything else. Yes, certainly roads, and uh, I don't know, uh, health care, and uh, Social Security, and all that would be privatized, yes. Okay, okay. All right, I'm getting a better picture. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I just was a little bit foggy as to, you know, the differences, the distinctions between the different um, parties and so forth. Well, I'm delighted that I was able to clarify a little bit. Thank, thank you very you. much for being on the uh, show. Thank you, too. guys. Keep up the, the show. It's really like a fun, interesting show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good so night. To the Mike show on uh, blogtalk.com. If you'd like to get on the show, it's uh, 347-826-7648. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll get back to talking about this. Um, you know, the caller brought up an interesting point, talking about politics. Um, and I make a separation between politics as in Republican, Democrat, fighting about stupid issues, and the deep philosophy of, of libertarianism, especially anarcho-capitalism. Because I think you lose a lot when you start picking on little issues like right now they're making a big deal about Obama not going to see the troops, um, little things like that. If you start getting bogged down in this minutia and you, you lose sight of the big picture of things. And I think the big picture in this case is, uh, you know, state aggression. And um, that's something that we need to remember that even, there, even though there's all these flashy, shiny objects in front of us and distracting us, the real issues need to be discussed, and that is, are we living in a really, truly free society, and should we be truly free, or should we have uh, legalized plunder in the form of state violence? I couldn't agree with you more. The, uh, the debates uh, uh, and, and what's going on with the Democrats and Republicans, well, the Republicans except for Ron Paul, uh, is just silly. I mean, the, you know, yes, we can, and, and we have to have hope, and you know, nonsense like that. And we have to stay in Iraq for a hundred years, and we have to be the uh, imperialist uh, country uh, 
uh, national greatness, conservatism. I mean, it's just uh, imperialism and fascism. Uh, you know, we talk about Hitler trying to take over the world. Well, the U.S. is trying to take over the world. We've got, what is it, uh, 800 foreign military bases in 140 different countries? If that's not trying to take over the world, I don't know what is. So uh, you've got these gigantic, stupendous uh, problems, and, you know, uh, Obama's saying, well, we should take a few troops out of Iraq and put them in Afghanistan. What the hell has Afghanistan got to do with us? When did any Afghani ever attack us? Well, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> why is the U.S. the imperialist, uh, warmongering country of the world? Uh, these are the, the issues that Ron Paul was talking about, and, you know, the inflation and getting rid of the Fed and uh, getting rid of uh, government regulation and legalizing uh, the drugs and stuff like that. Those are the important issues. And, uh, you know, what, what was happening during the Republican uh, uh, nomination that led up to McCain winning was just the, the seven or eight or ten other candidates were talking about, I don't know how old McCain was or how tough Rudy Giuliani was, and only Ron Paul was talking about the issues that you and I are interested in. Exactly, and and politics really distracts everybody. I mean, look at the stupid issues that came up during the campaigning and during the primary season is, you know, whether or not is Obama wearing a lapel pin, is is Giuliani mistress getting in the way, you know, and you completely get blindsided to what the real issues need to be. And it's amazing how in, in slogans come up like change and, and uh, hope and all these things, but there's no real explanation of what these things are. You know, they just spout, oh, right. we're here for hope and change. And, well, we're right. well, the only person who was really going to change things in Washington was uh, Ron Paul. Uh, this guy, what's his name, Barr now, who's running for uh, the Libertarian candidacy. Uh, I don't know. I, I suppose he's way better than uh, McCain or um, Obama, but he's not really as uh, Libertarian as he, as he could be. And Bob Barr, isn't that like one of those children's stories with the elephant? Am I the only one that remembers this thing with the elephant uh, Babar? Yeah. I oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I remember Babar. I used to read my kids those stories. No, I, I think uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't go that far as to compare him with the elephant. Um, it's just his last name. I don't. <laughs> I, I hear you, and I, I appreciate your sense of humor. But um, I would, uh, if I had to choose president between uh, Obama, McCain, Barr, and uh, Nader, I would pick Barr, uh, head and shoulders above the others. It's just I'm a little disappointed that he's not more libertarian than he is. Yeah, and um, so I have another Bye. question for you. Hello, are you there? Yeah, it's James again. I, I've been here the whole time. I'm just listening. Um, okay. I, 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 I have a better feed. on. I have another question, if I could. Sure, go, ahead. go right ahead, man. It's for Walter. Uh, there's a segment of the anarcho-capitalist um, community who just really hates Ron Paul just because he's involved with politics, and they feel that's sort of like a sin. And I'm not like that. I think Ron Paul's great because he sticks up for what's right, uh, even through all the hardships and all his peers hate him and everything, or at least they're indifferent to him. Uh, how do you feel about that segment of the anarcho-capitalist community? If you had something to say to them, uh, I'm – I'm I'm not against them per se, or you know I have no animus towards them. But what would you say to them? What, what advice would you give? Like the segment, they try to discredit Ron Paul and say, you know, he's just a loser because he's a politician. Well, it's not just the anarcho uh, capitalist or the uh, libertarian anarchist who are against that, but some libertarians who are minimal status are also against any uh, dealings with politics and. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's an interesting position, but it's not one with which I agree. Um, uh, there's this guy, Lysander Spooner, uh, who, uh, uh, one of our forebears, he wrote in the 19th century, a staunch libertarian, who said that voting is legitimate as a sort of a defensive thing. Look, if, if you're a slave and, and there are two uh, uh, slave masters or two overseers and one really likes the whip and the other uses it sparingly and somehow the master allows you, the slaves, to pick which overseer you want, I don't see that it's counter to libertarianism to pick the, the kinder overseer rather than the more vicious one. And, uh, you know, if there's a choice between two evils, I don't see anything wrong with picking the lesser of the two evils. And I don't see anything per se 
wrong with uh, running for office. It depends on what you do when you're in office. Now, I don't agree 100% with Ron Paul's program. I disagree with him a little bit about uh, abortion and immigration. But apart from those two things, I think he was utterly and absolutely magnificent. He did more to convert people to libertarianism than probably Ayn Rand and, and Milton Friedman put together, although I'm just speculating about that. I, I don't really know for sure. But he did magnificent yeoman work for, for the libertarian movement. And, uh, you know, look, suppose there was a, a saint, a saint libertarian who was in office, and every vote that he took, he just voted the libertarian line. Why is it per se wrong to be a, a politician? I, I just don't see it. Okay. I mean, it, it depends on what you do. Do you violate the non-aggression axiom? That's the litmus test for libertarians. And if you violate the uh, the uh, libertarian code of non-aggression, then of course you're to that extent not a libertarian. But suppose every vote and every action you take, whether it's governor or mayor or anything, president, was totally libertarian. You know, all you were trying to do is get rid of excessive government and for the anarchist, it's all excessive, and for the minarchist, it's not all excessive. But all you do is get rid of regulations, and you legalize things that ought to be legalized, and you do virtuous work. Why is it wrong if you do it as a politician? There's some sort of fetish that these people have that there's something per se wrong with being a politician. I just don't uh, agree with that. You don't agree. I just think oh. that most politicians are, are gross and disgusting because... Primarily because they violate the non-aggression axiom and they're all out for themselves. But um, one thing that I think we need to note about politicians is that they're just like everybody else. They're out for themselves, just like everybody else. There's nothing different that makes a politician more, um, I don't know, virtuous, if you will. Because I think a lot of people put so much uh, virtue on these politicians saying, well, these guys are really out there for the common good or for, for everybody's good. So they're really good and virtuous people. And I think it's they're just human beings and, you know, with looking out for their own self-interests. And very often it's hard to be that politician like Ron Paul and say, no, I'm not going to take part in this aggression against everybody else. And I'm just going to do, I'm going to vote to stop it. Whereas most politicians won't do that. Well, I think most politicians are gangsters with shirts and ties. They're thugs, uh, but not per se. In in my book, Defending the Undefendable, I defend the pimp. Now, most pimps are vicious, nasty people. Uh, and most uh, drug people are vicious, nasty people. But uh, I'm asking, per se, could, could we imagine a pimp who uh, didn't beat up his prostitute and just served as sort of an agent and a protector for her and yes, we can imagine that. So pimping is not per se uh, contrary to libertarianism, even if every pimp is a, is a violator of the non-aggression axiom. But uh, being a concentration camp guard, now that's per se uh, invasive. You, you can't imagine a good concentration camp guard. Well, I guess unless he's you know freeing all the prisoners or something like that. But acting uh, as a concentration camp guard would be, or a rapist or a murderer. You, you can't have a libertarian murderer or a libertarian rapist, but you could have a libertarian politician. Right. So, so isn't it true that if the market was completely free and there was no restrictions on prostitution, there would be a wide open sort of competitive prostitution market, and those pimps who beat their employees, I guess, or their their clients, would sort of be priced out of the market because they wouldn't find... You, you could have a peaceful pimp, or you could go to a, a violent pimp, and wouldn't you just choose the peaceful, peaceful one? Well, I think part of it would be, as you say, the market, but also violent pimps are uh, uh, engaging in assault and battery, and they should be put in jail. Okay. Uh, and, and in a free society, they should be put in jail, but not because mm -hmm. of pimping, but because of uh, assault and battery. Right. The yeah, act I of think pimping it, itself can be separated from the violence. Precisely. And so can... Uh, politicking uh, be separated from the violence. For example, if you're Ron Paul and, and you he was called Dr. No because he would vote against Dr. because he is a doctor and no because, you know, whenever there was a 434 vote against one, uh, he'd be the one and he'd usually, oh, not usually, he'd invariably be on the right side of things. So there's nothing per se wrong with a politician or a pimp. They both begin with the letter P. Uh, <laughs> it's just what you do. And Ron Paul was a libertarian politician, if ever there was one. Excellent point. Uh, James, did you have any other questions? 
No, I'm just sitting back listening. I'll let you know. <laughs> right. That <laughs> sounds, sounds fair. And if you'd like to get on board the uh, program uh, today, the number is 347-826-7648. You're listening to the uh, Mike Martin Show on blogtalkradio.com. Uh, you brought up a couple of points here in this last uh, uh, segment talking about um, crime and stuff. How would a libertarian society deal with violent criminals such as murderers and rapists? Well, I'll tell you, one thing is that the police wouldn't be uh, spending all their time uh, uh, w- with stopping peaceable activities like uh, drugs or prostitution or um, seat belts or whatever, and they'd be spending their time on uh, on uh, uh, real bad guys, the, the ones who violate the non-aggression axiom, like murderers and rapists and thieves and carjackers and people like that. Also, with drugs legalized, a lot of the impetus for crime would dis would disappear. So in other words, what the cops now are doing is not only are they not stopping crime, but they're creating crime by upholding the law against uh, marijuana and heroin and, and cocaine and things like that. See, the, the economics of uh, drug prohibition is that when you prohibit these drugs, the price rises very, very high. Uh, according to estimates, uh, the price, if these things were legalized, they'd be very, very cheap. Marijuana is sort of a weed that grows very Easily, it, it's um, a hardy weed type of product, and uh, uh, the same thing with the poppy field. It's not like asparagus, which is reasonably expensive because you have to do a lot of care and feeding of it. Um, I'm speaking metaphorically here. So, look, suppose that the, the price of a, uh, a marijuana habit was, um, I don't know, $5 or $7 a week, a dollar a day. Is anyone going to steal for that? No. Uh, is anyone going to have uh, fights over that? No. And, and we have an empirical example in front of us, and, and it's prohibition of alcohol. Nowadays, is there any fighting over um, uh, uh, beer or wine or whiskey? The, the, the Elliot Ness needed to stop the uh, Chicago mafia criminals from supplying this stuff? No. The whole thing is silly. Uh, when, when we got rid of the uh, horrible uh, experiment with the prohibition of alcohol, the, the crime rate in, in that industry uh, practically disappeared. Well, it would be similar in drugs. If we legalize them, all of the criminal uh, element of that would, would disappear. Some estimates are that 60% of all prisoners uh, in major cities are there for drug-related uh, uh, crimes. So if we legalize that... Um, We'd have, uh, you know, many fewer uh, crimes uh, and many fewer people in jail. And the police would be able to focus on real criminals, the, the ones who are violating the non-aggression act, seem like murderers and rapists and thieves and contractors and fraudsters and people like that. That's a very excellent point because not a lot of people see that. You know, we waste our time having cops, especially in New York, there's... there's I mean, the cops are just doing nothing most of the times. Uh, they're wasting their time looking for people. The teenager is smoking pot once in his life, and they waste all the resources of putting that teenager through the system and all the courts and all that thing, all wasted resources, when they could be learning about more about criminals that actually cause damage to private property and to person. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they should focus on real criminals, not the... Uh law violators of illicit uh, laws that are illicit in the first place. That's a good point. But now what happens if the, if the police are private? How do they deal with uh, violent criminals then? Well, the same way. Uh, you know, uh, look, uh, you're from New York City. Uh, yeah. Suppose I said I'll meet you in Central Park at uh, 3 in the morning tonight. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about them apples? Uh, are you willing to do this? No. Uh, if you have any sense, you, you're probably not because it's uh, it's lawless under the New York City's finest. But if I tell you, uh, let's meet in Disney World uh, at three in the morning, assuming Disney World is open, then I'm not sure. Do you have any compunction about meeting me at a certain place in Disney World? Of course not. not Namely, the private uh, look. If you're obstreperous in Disney World, you're surrounded by a bunch of uh, mice and dogs and ducks, yeah. all packing heat. And they'll come up to you and say, you know, please come with me. And if you don't, they uh, they, they come get you. The, the point is that Disney World and Disneyland and uh, places like that uh, have private police. And those private police 
look, if a rape occurs in Disney World, do you know what's going to happen in poor Disney World? They're going to lose millions of dollars. So what they do is they have an incentive to stop crime. They have cameras all over the place, and they have these uh, policemen wearing duck uniforms and sometimes wearing regular uniforms. And the crime rate in, in those places is virtually zero. Not zero, given the human element, but virtually zero. Whereas on the streets, uh, New Orleans, uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, every week there's murders and on the city streets. The, 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 you see, the point is that private policemen who don't do a good job go the same way of restaurants that don't do a, jo do a good job, namely they go bankrupt. Whereas public police uh, are like the Army Corps of Engineers or FEMA. They don't go broke no matter how bad a job they do. So I think that, you know, it's just lunacy to think that if we go to private police, somehow there'll be mayhem in the streets. There's mayhem in the streets now because of inefficiency of police, because they don't get, they don't go broke from doing a bad job. Now, can you just imagine, like, uh, you know, <laughs> police officers dressed as the seven dwarfs, you know? Excuse, Excuse me, sir, sir you're, you're being, being a distraction. distraction. Come, Come with me now. You know, things like that. Well, look, uh, Snoop, Snoopy and Doggy or whatever the Seven Dwarfs are, they, they keep the peace in Disney World. You go into Disney World and it is safe. It you is. walk around in certain streets in uh, South Bronx or Bed-Stuy or Harlem or whatever, and uh, you take your life in your hands. It's madness. It really is. But what I like about private police or private security is they don't harass you. Um, the, the greatest difference, uh, speaking since we're talking about Disney World, is uh, my last trip to Disney World is about two years ago. So in this post 9/11 world, and uh, when I got on the plane in Orlando, or actually before I got on the plane in Orlando, the transportation security people were harassing us. You know, they make you take everything apart. Took my laptop out of the bag. They were swiping it with all kinds of special swabs and, and detectors and things like that, like they've never seen it before. Because you're giving these people the authority to ruin your day or ruin your vacation. Whereas Look, th these are the people that were uh, grabbing nail clippers for a while. Can you imagine nail clippers? I know. Come on, give me a break. I mean, if they had allowed those pilots to have guns, you never would have had 9-11. Uh, most of those pilots are ex-military uh, types and perfectly capable of uh, dealing with a gun. Uh, the, the fall 9-11... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, 9-11 was the fault of the government in two ways. One, they took a stick and shook it at a hornet's nest uh, in the Middle East and got people very upset with us, and that was the blowback that Ron Paul is talking about. And secondly, they wouldn't allow the uh, pilots uh, to, to have guns. And, uh, you know, the, the TSA is just crazy. I mean, uh, you can't bring toothpaste of, with a big, uh, you know, six-inch long or eight-inch long toothpaste tube. You have to have a three-inch, uh, what do you call it, uh, toothpaste. And I mean, if there was competition and there was the TSA versus the Acme Agency, you know that TSA would be long gone. Uh, they're, they're just lunatic. Uh, and they make people miss uh, flights, and it's just a hassle, and now they come up with this machine that can see through people's clothes, and you get all sorts of weirdos and perverts in there. So uh, this is just an illustration of public police. No, private police would be much more efficient. Exactly. And, um, you know, the, the thing about, like, private security, and if it came to, uh, say, I don't know, uh, Macy's or something, if they have private security guards, they can't harass you because if they start harassing people, customers are not going to go into Macy's anymore. They're just going to turn around and go elsewhere. Look, I think they have police in Macy's and Gimbel's and those big department stores, and uh what they have, the, the view there is that the customer's always right, and uh, okay, a pickpocket or a, a person who's stealing the goods, you stop them, but you don't hassle people. Uh, you know, uh, they're very politically correct. Most of the uh, problems with airlines have been done by uh, male uh, people of Ar Ar Arabic extraction. So what are you hassling some black grandma for? I mean, there's no black grandma that's ever done anything like that, or some mother with uh, three babies, and, and you're I don't know, when, when my uh, son was little, they were even searching his diaper. I mean, you know, <laughs> the whole thing is crazy. And if, if it was based on market principles, they, those people would be bankrupt and out of business uh, uh, 
a long time ago. Now they're very, very, way, very well maybe an explosive load in your uh, kid's diaper, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I but, mean, uh, I mean, they, it's political correctness gone berserk. You know, you, you're not supposed to profile. They're, they're not racially profiling; they're criminally profiling. You know, when they start hassling. Uh, 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 Arab grandmas who have never done anything like this, then, then I'll say that it's uh, racial profiling or, or baby Arabs or something like that. But uh, most of the uh, terrorists have been um, young men uh, aged, I don't know, 20 to 40 or 20 to 35 of Arabic extraction. And yet they're hassling everybody. They're even hassling U.S. Marines. There was a story not too long after the TSA was formed that uh, a bunch of Marines were coming back from Afghanistan, you know, <laughs> having just served in the war, and they could not wear their ribbons on their chest because of the pins. Ah, yes, yes. Them. Those pins, they could stick people with them, I suppose. Exactly. I mean, like, you know, if you buy into the whole propaganda, these guys are our heroes. Are they really going to take down a plane? I mean, yeah. it's a little ridiculous. But you know what's really ridiculous is the security checkpoints here in New York City. Um, I work just off of Union Square Park, and uh, today there, was, there happened to be the random security checkpoint screening day. And um, if you've ever been in the city's uh, to Union Square subway station, you have to go down the stairs to get to the main uh, sort of concourse of the uh, station. So what they do is the cops set up right before the turnstiles. So if you're a terrorist, you go down the stairs, you walk down the hall a little bit, you see the security checkpoint, if you've got a bomb in your bag, you just turn around and walk away and come back another day when they're not doing the security check. Right. Look, in the airport, they've got all sorts of uh, garbage cans that are covered. You know, you slip uh, a bomb in a, in a garbage can before you go to the security checkpoint and you can take out an airport. I mean, it, it's just sort of make work. Uh, I don't know. It, it's government for you. Look, these are the people that run the post office. These are the people that run the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Why do you expect any sense from them? These are the <laughs> counterparts of the Soviet uh, bureaucrats who were, uh, you know, ruining uh, Russia for 70 years. You know, why should we expect any sense out of these people? I certainly don't. I, I laugh at people who do expect things to work out, and then they go, they get all teary-eyed when it doesn't work out. You know, this is what led me to, to want to do this show is picking up the paper every day and seeing these ridiculous things that are happening because of government intervention and just people do not see the obvious. Yes, I don't know. I, uh, look, that's part of the reason I'm a professor, uh, that you're a radio broadcaster. We want to, we see injustice, we see craziness around, we want to speak out against it. I think that's wonderful. I'm delighted to be with you as a partner in this show now. The Mike Martin Show here on blogtalkradio.com, your home for great alternative talk radio. Uh, of course, the number of, if you'd like to get on board the program is 347-826-7648. Now, James is still with us on the line here. So, uh, James, you got a question that you want to ask uh, Professor Block. I do. Well, I do. It's not, really, well, it, it's not really a question. It's more of sort of I want you to discuss a topic uh, that's, pretty heated in libertarian circles right now uh, with intellectual property. Uh, I, myself, I'm against intellectual property. I don't think it's property because it's not physical and there can't be borders around it. You can't really touch it. So how can it be property? Um, it's more like a pattern or an idea and you really can't own that. So I just want to know what you thought. Well, I agree with you entirely. I am opposed to intellectual property. Now, it's interesting that Murray Rothbard used to say patents were bad, but copyrights are good. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for a long time, I agreed with Murray, as I agree with him on most things. Not all things, but most things. And then Stefan Kinsella came along with a magnificent yeah. article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. I think it won the award for the best article that year published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And uh, Stefan Kinsella just blew the whole thing out of the water as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Stefan's idea is that the whole purpose of property is to settle disputes. Like, we have to have property in things like oranges and apples and cows and, and watches and other tangible things because they're scarce. And mm -hmm. there's a question, well, who owns them? I mean, do you have a right to use this golf club or do I have a right to use the golf club? Do you have a right to use the... Uh, this, um, I don't know, uh, car, or do I have a right? And we have to have some way of deciding. 
and property rights are the way to decide. But when you have things that are superfluous, uh, where, where there's no dispute, where we can both use them, say air, you know, like when I run the marathon and after I'm finishing the marathon, not that I run it, but if I did, I'd be going like this. <laughs> Namely, I'd be panting and gasping for air. Nobody's going to come up, with me, up to me and say, hey, you, you know, you're being a little selfish. You're, you're <laughs> taking in too much air. I mean, that's crazy because air is not a, uh, an economic good because uh, it's not a scarce good. Well, the same is true for um, ideas, whether uh, uh, patent or copyright. Well, first, let me uh, make Murray's point about the difference between patents and copyrights. What Murray used to say is, look, um, suppose two people are uh, trying to invent the bicycle. And uh, they both independently invent the bicycle, and Mr. A gets into the patent office all oh, five minutes before Mr. B. Well, Mr. A gets uh, 100% of the value of that patent, and Mr. B, who is an independent inventor, and if you believe that, you know, uh, ideas uh, can be owned, well, you know, poor Mr. B, uh, he invented it. We stipulate, we take it from a God's eye point of view so we know exactly what's going on. The facts are not in dispute. Well, poor Mr. B. And then another problem is usually patents are for, what, 17 years or 27 years or something like that. But look, if I own a pencil, I own this pencil forever. And uh, not only do I own it for my life, but I can give it to my kid who can give it to his kid. So what's with this uh, craziness? If, if property rights are really property rights, uh, they should be forever. So patents were just screwy uh, in, in various ways. Well, what about uh, copyrights? Copyrights... Uh, for Murray were more sensible because they could emanate from contract. Namely, I sell you this CD or I sell you this medicine or I sell you this Coca-Cola on the grounds that you promise not to copy it because I have copyright over it. And uh, this is a little bit more sensible than patents because it doesn't have the same, um, uh, the same problems of stealing uh, from independent owners. Okay, now what's Stefan's argument against uh, um, copyrights is if A sells B something on the condition that B not copy it, suppose B loses it, or suppose B is, uh, suppose what it is is a song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Now I'm going to ruin your radio audience by singing it. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. You see why I shouldn't sing? Okay, so A sells B the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and now B is whistling it in a shower, and he's overheard by C. Well, now C starts singing it, and A says, hey, you know, uh, you can't sing this song because uh, I own it and I gave it to B on the condition that they're not copy and, and you heard him and, you know, you can't, uh, you can't do that. This is sort of a, a little lunatic here. Uh, look, the, the whole idea is incoherent because the idea has to be expressed in words, right? The mm -hmm. idea that you can own, a, you can own um, uh, property and ideas has to be expressed in words. Well, if you really had ownership in uh, ideas, words or ideas. So every time I say anything, for example, the word anything, now Mr. Anything probably invented the word anything. And who am I to use the word without uh, uh, paying him or his heirs? And yeah. the word heirs and, and the word the and the word and and the word but was created by Mr. But. So the point is that you're committing some sort of performative contradiction by even saying that intellectual property is uh, is a good idea because if it was a good idea, you should shut up. You can't <laughs> even say it because you're saying it in words that were created by other people and you're not paying them. So the whole thing is crazy. Now look, girl A puts her hair up in a ponytail and girl B sees this and says, hey, what do you do? I'll put my hair up in a ponytail. Did she un... Uh, tell the pony of, uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but did she go to A and mess with her hair and, and so that A no longer has a ponytail? No. Uh, a still has a ponytail. So what did B steal from A? Nothing. Uh, right. The idea is that, that ideas, once the, the recipe is known, uh, you know, the, the second guy can have it without the first one. And if you tell girl B, no, 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 you can't have a pon your hair in a ponytail, what you're really doing is committing some sort of rape on her, in effect, because you're telling her how she can use her body and how she can't use her body in a way that is not violating the rights of other people, and ponytails certainly don't do that. Yeah, so aren't you really owning a, in effect, you'd really be owning a piece of everything that used that pattern. 
So if you wrote a book and then you prohibited anyone else from writing the book, you own all the pencils in the world that might write those words down. Isn't that so? That's like right. it's ridiculous. That's, That's right. Ridiculous. Like uh, yeah. I think somebody said that they work for a copy machine place or something like that. If yeah. you uh, had this law, you would own everyone's ink and everyone's paper and everyone's pens and everyone's pencil, or at least a share of it, uh, so that they couldn't write what you didn't want them to write. Now, some people say, okay, okay, I see the the uh, deontological point about this, but uh, from a practical point of view, a utilitarian point of view, if we didn't have patents, we wouldn't have, and now they go into a long list, we wouldn't have pharmaceuticals, we wouldn't have um, uh, people writing books, we wouldn't have... Um, people writing, uh, uh, singing songs and doing CDs and things like that. Well, on this empirical issue, it's not as clean as, as the principled libertarian position, but uh, let me make the following points. See, right now, if I'm going to invent a new machine or a new pharmaceutical, not only am I going to have to hire biologists or uh, chemists or engineers, I'm going to have to hire lawyers because I have to invent around all present patents and copyrights. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm the, saying? Doesn't it have I, the effect? I, I, I'm Go sorry, on. I can't hear you. Uh, doesn't it have the effect of really forcing people to reinvent the wheel over and over, over again? Instead of just using it. existing well, te- technologies, you have to sort of remake the technology just in a different way, where it could have worked the first time, just the the same, and you could just build upon that. So really, it stifles innovation instead of sort of prodding it on, right? Well, it does both. It, uh, on the one hand, it does stifle, uh, you know, uh, patents do encourage innovation because they promise you if you invent something, you get to keep the value of it for 17 years or whatever it is. On the other hand, they stifle innovation because you just can't innovate. You have to innovate a- around other people's innovations. Mm-hmm. And you have to spend a lot of time with high-priced lawyers who uh, are also chemists who know the- these kind of laws. Uh, in other words, it's like a landmine out there. You just can't go out and invent something. You have to invent things circuitously around all the other extant patents, and you have to spend a lot of money in courts uh, defending it. So that that way it cycles it. Doesn't uh, it sort of politicizes the entire field? Right. Uh, take my book, Defending the Undefendables. Suppose somebody else were to uh, write, you know, buy a copy and then Xerox it and start selling it. Now, if they if they said that they wrote it, that would be a lie and that would be fraud. But suppose they kept my name on it and they just sold it and, and they started making money off the sales. Would that hurt me? No. Uh, rather, that would drive the price, my speaking price. Uh, when I give speeches, I charge uh, honorarium uh, speaker's fees. Well, these people who are now publicizing my book are getting me more gigs. It's the same thing with uh, the Beatles or uh, Elvis or any of the, the Death Jam or something that you were playing before. <laughs> if I make more videos like that and, and more people hear about it, more people are going to want to hear them give live concerts. So it's really unclear as to whether it will stifle it or not. It's an empirical issue. On the one hand, yes, there will be uh, out certain royalties. On the other hand, their concert fees will go up. So it's very unclear as to whether there will be more or less innovation but as Stephen Kinsella says, he, he thinks that the optimal amount of, of, uh, of innovation or creativity is the amount that's compatible with libertarianism. And what's compatible with libertarianism is non-aggression. And you're not aggressing when you put your hair in a ponytail just because you saw someone else do it. Sure. Well, right. My biggest issue with this whole thing is when you buy a CD, when you buy something that becomes your property and you're under your control – how uh, organizations like the Recording Industry Association of America, you know, feel like they have the right to tell you how to then use that product. I mean, no other thing that you buy has that kind of restriction on it. You could buy a a pair of glasses and use them any way you want. Uh, So I I have an issue with that because it's it's not something that's under under their control anymore. You have acquired it, and and in essence, you have kind of homesteaded it. It's become part of your property. And therefore, I have the right to do what you want with it, you know, like play it in front of your friends or give it to your friends to copy even, things like that. Stephen Kinsella has this magnificent uh, little um, story in his uh, beautiful, brilliant article. And what it is is that uh, there's this town, 
And uh, I know that the railroad is coming through. And right now, the land sells for ten dollars an acre because it's just scrub land, and you know you can't grow much on it. But when the railroad comes through, instead of ten dollars an acre, it'll be worth uh, ten thousand an acre. Okay. So what happens is that uh, you, Mike, you break into my uh, house and you find the the secret letter that I've got that says the railroad is coming through. And now you're a thief, and you know you should go to jail. You're a bad guy. But what you do is you go to the, uh, the local bar where Clem and the boys are hanging out, and you tell everyone that, hey, guess what? The railroad is coming through. You got that? Yeah. Mike is the bad guy. He stole this. He, he broke in and entered into my house, and he stole the idea, and he shared the idea with a whole bunch of townspeople in the bar. Okay, now I go to the townspeople and I say, hey, I'd like to buy your land at $10 an acre. And they all say, ah, $10 an acre, get lost. The railroad's coming through. We want uh, 100000 an acre or 10000 an acre or whatever it is. We want the higher price. Now, according to intellectual property, you see, Mike, if you, bro- if you broke into my house and you stole my TV and you gave it to the uh, to sea, right. I could get that back, right? Right. It's your legitimate property. It's, it's my legitimate property. It's my TV. And just because you gave it to someone else or sold it to them, it doesn't matter. I'm the rightful owner. I get it back. So, Stephen Gonzalez says, if property, if intellectual property is really not property, what I ought to be able to do is go to all the townspeople that you told about the, the railroad coming through who are now asking 10000 an acre. I ought to be able to make them pay, uh, uh, accept $10 an acre. Mm-hmm. Isn't that ludicrous? Yeah. Uh, and yet that's one of the logical implications of this crazy idea that you can own ideas. You know what? I want to trademark the little trademark symbol. <laughs> I want to trademark the alphabet. That would be, yeah. be justice, wouldn't it? You know? That's beautiful. Is libertarianism is, is lots of fun. It is. Come up with libertarian jokes. No one else is going to laugh at them, but we can have a ball. Well, that's why I really enjoy listening to your uh, Mises podcast, because you throw in some jokes there that uh, only libertarians would get. <laughs> we ought to have a T-shirt. It's a libertarian thing you wouldn't understand. I, I like the one about <laughs> antitrust. You go on about antitrust in the room of ah. lawyers. Yeah. Yes, yes. I've, I've got a great antitrust joke. Shall I tell it? Oh, Please. Lord, yeah. Okay. It's a two-part joke. In the first part of the joke, there are three Soviet prisoners, and they're all in jail in the gulag, and they're uh, comparing notes as to why they're in jail. And the first guy said, well, I came to work late, and they accused me of stealing uh, uh, labor services from the state, which owns all the labor services, so they put me in jail. And the second guy says, well, I came to work early every day, and they accused me of brown-nosing, and they put me in jail. And the third guy said, I came to work every day exactly on time to the second and they put me in jail because they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first part of the joke. I once told this joke to a bunch of uh, lawyers and economists who make a lot of money from antitrust, and they loved this joke. But then they didn't like the second part of the joke. The second part of the joke goes like this. There were three U.S. prisoners in jail, and they were all uh, guilty of a violation of antitrust. And the first guy says, well, I charge more than everyone else, and they put me in jail for for gouging and profiteering. The second guy said, I uh, charge less than everyone else, and they put me in jail for predatory pricing and cutthroat competition. The third guy said, well, I charge the same price as everyone else, which is a little hard to see because of these other two guys, but what the heck, it's just a joke. And uh, so I charge the same thing, and and they they accused me of collusion and and setting up uh, uh, cartels. And it was deathly silence because these people were very bright people, and they understood (laughs) <laughs> and, and the point is that in the Soviet system, if you come to work early, later on time, and they put you in jail, well, you know, that's no law. Law is supposed to distinguish between, you know, legitimate activity and illegitimate activity. But it's the same thing with antitrust law. If you can go to jail for higher, lower, or the same prices, you know, what kind of a law is that? Right. I mean, the law against rape is good. If, if you rape, you go to jail. And if you don't rape, you're, you stay out of jail. But with these other kinds of... Uh, things so uh, you you go to jail no matter what you do, which is just um, horrific. And yet that's our antitrust system. It is. It's really despicable because, <laughs> like you said, there's nothing you can do. Is that, what can you do? You know. 
Look, poor Bill Gates. The reason uh, they were after him is because he he sat out there in Seattle and he just made computers and he didn't bribe the Republicans and he didn't bribe the Democrats and he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't play the game the way the powers that be want the game played. He was just a laissez-faire capitalist type. Right. I mean, he created an industry, he created employment, he uh, made the lives of many people happier, but he didn't uh, pay off uh, the, the boys in Washington, D.C. So they got on his case. Now that he's set up his, um, what do you call it, uh, his foundation, and now that he's stuffing money down the throats of everybody, uh, he won't be guilty of any more antitrust uh, violations, I, I would predict. It's a shame, too, because isn't his, isn't his capital worth more sort of going into resources so that he can employ people and make more products and get the market going instead of just giving it away to all these, you know, charities and things? Right. Well, he could be better in society. And, yeah, by uh, profit instead of... Right. Well, there, that's a very interesting question as to whether uh, he's doing more good now than he was before. And uh, I, I would tend to uh, think that it's an empirical question, namely whether you do more good. It's not really a libertarian question. And I would tend to say yes, that he was doing more good when he was uh, making computers, and not because uh, charity is bad, but because his charity is not in accordance with libertarianism. He's not promoting liberty. I mean, if he were giving money to the Mises Institute or, uh, <laughs> you know, a libertarian party or something like that, then I'd say he's doing more good uh that way than making money, uh, even though he made billions of dollars and made a lot of people happier. But, uh, you know, he's sort of uh, taking up the, the lefty, hippie uh, ways of looking at uh, cures for poverty, and uh, he, he's not really a, a free enterpriser. Well, we've got only five minutes left here on the Mike Martin Show. Uh, so I just want to let everybody know that if you've got any questions or comments, and you didn't get them in during the show, you could always email them to MikeMartinShow at gmail.com. And um, always, uh, we're going to be here, uh, Stirk and I, on Mondays. Uh, starting next week, we'll be at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on uh, blogtalkradio.com, which will be a lot easier for a lot of people because I, I know I'm getting tired here, and it's uh, 12.55 a.m. on the East Coast. So um, we've got now four minutes remaining. So... Walter, I want to give you the last word and, uh, you know, throw in uh, anything you, you'd like to add to the to the program here. Well, uh, I think on, on the email you sent me, the, there were seven questions, uh, like uh, roads and police right. and courts, and I, I forget other things. Um, it's really too late to do justice to all of those things, but I, I wanted to commend you for your initiative. I think it's a wonderful radio program. I, I think you're you're doing the Lord's work, as they say. You're... You're promoting liberty, and I'm just uh, delighted to be uh, part of it. And uh, maybe uh, I'll revisit you uh, again one of these days. Excellent. We'd love to have you on, uh, you know, political Jedi, of course, or at least philosophical Jedi, more accurately. And uh, my philosophical uh, burrito. <laughs> Are you still on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still, still here. I'm still uh, here. Uh, he, I'll go on from to... time to time. I'll 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 be your net. I'll be your your bother, and then you can kick me out when you want to. Well, a lot of this is fun because you know I I just came up with the burrito thing. Uh, I hadn't planned it. I hadn't planned on calling uh, <laughs> a stir fat or anything like that. But this is part of the creative process that you know you come up with things when you're. Uh, in other words, the process itself is creative, and you come up with new ways of looking at things and. You've been a great inspiration to me by asking me those very good, provocative questions. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, that reminds me, uh, Chris, are you still there? I am, yes. All right. I actually, uh, I took a trip to Taco Bell and got some burritos because I was kind of hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and the munchies, huh? Yeah, you know, it, it hit me. I, I just kept hearing about it, so I, was, you know, I got hungry. How do you feel now about... Uh, Capitalist anarchy. I, I feel more enlightened on the uh, on the topic. I feel like I, I you know I know a little bit more about it and uh, understand it more. So uh, you know I would like to you know thank you for uh, taking the time to speak here with us. Well, if you want to if you want to do uh, further reading on this, go to the Mises web uh, Mises dot org and right. look up um, uh, um, Roderick Long, uh, Ten Objections to Anarchy. And look up Hans Hoppe and look up Murray Rothbard and uh, Stephen Kinsella. I've done a bit on that, too. 
Uh, there's a lot of good reading, or just look up at the Mises Web under uh, anarcho-libertarianism or libertarian anarchism, and you'll get uh, uh, a wonderful bibliography, and people can read this stuff and uh, deal with objections. I think that would be a very good educational suggestion. And please uh, check out uh, www.mises.org, Mises Web, because there are so many great resources on there. Um, if you'd like, you could get an entire education in economics just from listening to the podcasts, which are great because you just you put them on while you go to work, and on your car in the morning, on your iPod, um, or if you're trying to avoid the bums in New York City, it's always great too. Uh, put it on your iPod and listen to uh, Mises podcasts. Uh, but hopefully this show will be uh, ending up as a Mises podcast, so uh, we're spreading the word that way. Uh, the Mike Martin, Sh Mike Martin Show, of course, yep. 